Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name's Hugh Price. Uh, I'm one of the founders of the Center for the Study of Existential Risk and now academic director of the Levy Hume Center for the Future of Intelligence, which is also sponsoring tonight's lecture. Um, and I'm very delighted to introduce our speaker, whom I met for the first time this morning at this interesting workshop um, that CESAR has organized. Sabrina Leonelli is Professor of Philosophy and History of Science at the University of Exeter, uh, where she co-directs the Exeter Center for the Study of the Life Sciences and leads their data, data studies research strand. Um, her research focuses on the philosophy of data-intensive science, the history and epistemic and ethical implication of data curation and research data management, and the ways in which the open science movement is redefining what counts as research and knowledge across research environments. Uh, we're very delighted to have her here this evening to talk to us on the topic of how to reuse big data. Sabrina, welcome. Thank you very much. It is a delight to be in Cambridge and see many friendly faces in the audience. And um, what I'm going to be doing is to go through some of the results of a variety of research projects I've been conducting over the last 10 years or so over the notion of data in general and uh, more recently increasingly on large data sets, so so-called big data. And so the plan for today is to spend a little bit of time on what I see as the promise and the reality of um, big data and open data. And I'm going to talk about the methods that I use in my research and the, one of the research of my group in uh, trying to explore uh, some of these issues by actually looking at what scientists are doing with data on a daily basis. And then I'm going to try and go into a kind of more destructive part, if you want, of the talk, and a more constructive one. So the more destructive one would be to start to think about what are the big challenges that we're looking at when we're trying to particularly to reuse big data for a variety of purposes. And I'm going to try and list, basically go through five of these challenges, conservatism, convenient sampling, like the idea of uh, bad data or what kind of you know, house of cards, um, self-interest, and social damage. And then I'm going to try and go through five lessons that we've learned by looking at the questions about how to repurpose data from the more philosophical, historical, and social scientific viewpoint, and think about what are the kind of suggestions or what are the potential uh, things that we can learn from uh, those kind of studies. And I'm going to try and um, conclude going towards an epistemology, what I'm calling data use. Now, there's a very specific reason why I'm thinking about data use rather than just inference. And partly that's because I want to capture also the pragmatic um, uh, issues that arise when you're trying to really do work with data on a daily basis. And think about the conditions under which big data can be used to reliably inform inferential reasoning. So first of all, on big and open data, I probably don't need to really say much to this audience about what the discourse around big and open data is. I mean, we are looking at a situation where we have increasingly new and emerging technologies for producing and storing lots of data, lots of different types of data, in a way that's very fast, and data that really are about, you, can, you could argue, anything and everything. And we also are looking at the emergence of new institutions and also new communication platforms for disseminating those data. And one of the ones that I'm going to be talking a lot about is data infrastructures and databases, which have been a focus of my work now for, for a number of years. And we're also, of course, looking at new forms of data analysis and computing and automation. And of course, uh, the audience today, in particular the Center for the Future of Intelligence, I'm sure, is looking at, at some of those in, in much detail. And so there is a strong sense that by um, looking at big and open data, we are looking at, we are considering them uh, to be a sort of gateway to a whole new set of social behaviors, services that can be extracted from the use of this data, and self-understanding for people using this data to go about their business and, and to understand themselves. And in fact, I think one of the things that underpins um, a lot of these developments in science, some of which, of course, are not new, I mean, people in research have been dealing with large data sets for a very, very long um, time, but is this idea that data themselves are acquiring a relatively novel status in science. They're talked about much more, like data publications start to actually be recognized as publications in themselves, in a sense, separately from the publication of claims made from inferences from those data, and therefore there is a whole new landscape 
around how does one um, deal with data, how does one curate the data, how does one manage them so that um, data can actually be disseminated in a variety of different ways. And um, here you see also some indications of um, what people call the open ecosystem and the idea that in fact um, data not only come in large quantities these days, certainly in a lot of fields, but also there is um, an increasing expectation that data will be more widely disseminated than just uh, to the people who are involved in creating uh, the data in the first place. And so there's a lot of initiatives, both at the level of lobbying among researchers, but also um, very involved in initiatives by the European Commission in trying to foster this agenda of actually uh, increasing uh, the level of open data which are available and implement the so-called fair data, so actually making data accessible, reusable, et cetera. And this is sort of the landscape where uh, my talk is situated. Now, why an insistence on big and open data? What actually makes them valuable? There's a whole variety of reasons why people are um, very interested in uh, the circulation of very large data sets. And there is attached, uh, they're attached to the idea that you could improve the pathways to discovery and also the quality of discovery themselves. So of course, data mining can help you in lots of ways. Um, it can help you to spot gaps in your knowledge and opportunities for new research directions, for instance. It helps collaborations across different research sites and um, across different disciplines also, and in fact, across countries. And that, in fact, has always been the case in the history of science, but particularly now is, is coming to the fore in the last um, 10, 15 years or so. Um, it can help to improve the uptake of new technologies, particularly computational technologies. Uh, it can help with research evaluation and debate around the transparency of science and of the research process. So highlighting the fact that we are looking at um, ways in which um, uh, basically components of science that are not necessarily part of the final claim that is extracted from any one project, but are equally important to try and reconstruct what the process to get to those particular claims could be. And um, the idea is also that is indeed um, trying to um, highlight the fight against fraud, low quality duplication of efforts by making, it, making the data available for scrutiny. And in that sense, enhance the legitimacy of science, public trust and engagement. So there's a lot of expectations relating to the use of big and open data. Now, um, I'm going to argue that, in fact, the key to understanding the discourse around big and open data and also all the challenges in, in uh, implementing some of this vision and achieving this potential is actually the idea of data reuse. So what we really want to have, that's the whole reason why we're talking about open data in the first place, is data which actually can be used, that can be valued across different research contexts beyond the one in which they were originally produced, and for a whole variety of different purposes. Now, obviously, trivially, you may say, what this really means is actually making data mobile and useful across groups with a variety, with different expertise. So you could say, in fact, that the value of big and open data resides first and foremost in their mobility, in their capacity to actually travel to places which are not the ones in which they were originally produced. And what I'm going to try and argue is that there are major challenges to realizing that potential of mobility, particularly when one is dealing with very large data sets and very complex data sets. So um, the way in which I've been going about trying to uh, do my research is in the context of mostly a project called Epistemology Data Intensive Science, which is funded by the European Research Council. And the main point about that project was actually to investigate, fine, we're talking about big and open data, but are people actually reusing the data? Under which condition is it actually possible to reuse the data? And what kind of labor does it take to make data re reusable and like, to make it possible to repurpose these materials? And we are trying to do this by doing what we call tracking data journeys. So we're literally tracking the ways in which certain data sets travel from the sites in which they were originally produced, typically through large data infrastructures that curate them and annotate them and make them available to a broader audience, and then eventually to different labs and different groups that, will, that are different from the um, groups that produced them in the first place, which then pick them up and reuse them for their own purposes. And the reason to do this as a philosopher, historian, of science is the fact that you can track some of those movements by quantitative methods. But in fact, this is quite difficult due to the fact that most people don't really cite data sets, they cite papers. Sometimes, rarely, they cite databases, but not really specific data sets. And in fact, it's very, very hard to try and understand how data are being reused without doing very specific qualitative work, which for us involves actually talking to a lot of scientists, interviewing them about their experiences, and trying to reconstruct these data journeys. So uh, the focus of this work partly is on databases, 
in a sense, we, we use them as a starting point, as a window to try and understand what are the uh, conditions, what is the kind of material, conceptual, and institutional labor which is required to make data widely accessible and usable. And particularly, uh, I'm interested in the kind of labels and the software that is used to classify the data, model them and visualize them. And also uh, the management of these infrastructures and their communications, how that's actually uh, worked out. And also, uh, we've looked at a number of cases of data reuse to investigate actually under which conditions do these data um, get reused, what was kind of a good set of conditions, what were potential problems in the ways in which uh, data were presented, and what the implications are for how we conceptualize discovery, and in fact, how we conceptualize good research, a research that is productive to some extent. So in that sense, we're very interested also in the role of open science movement, um, um, you know, the open science movement in knowledge generation in general. So, um, as I was saying very briefly, the methods that we're using to do some of this work are a lot of empirical sources ranging from archives to scientific literature, um, very often in-depth uh, interviews with um, the people who are actually doing some parts of this work, data curators, uh, people who are reusing data or producing it in the first place, and participant observation of some of these practices. And in fact, we tend to end up collaborating with quite a lot of the uh, researchers that we um, start a conversation with. So we ended up kind of co-authoring quite a few papers in, in, in different parts of this, um, um, of our cases. So the idea here is to look at a variety of data types, not just a particular <laughs> set of data. So for instance, a lot of people have done a lot of work on genomic data specifically, but we're interested in actually expanding the limit of what kinds of data we're considering, uh, even if we're still focused mostly on the biological and biomedical sciences and different types of research goals, methods and instruments used to produce the data. And we are very interested in area-specific requirements and the ethos of communities which are actually dealing with those data and handling them. Um, and uh, we've done, we started to do uh, quite a bit of work in trying to look at the difference between data handling in high resource environment, like here, where there are a lot of resources, there's a lot of funding, um, for that, you, know, you may think not, but relative to other places, <laughs> you actually do have quite a lot of resources to um, make use of these technologies and, we use computational technologies to mine data in places where some of those structures may not be in place, but there's still very, very good research happening. So um, just to give you an idea of the kind of thing I'm talking about, um, this is um, a very poor visualization of one of the main data journeys I've been documenting now for about 15 years, um, which is um, the journey of data which relate to the model plant Arabidopsis, which is a very small flowering plant which is as the property of being the main model organism still for the plant science, and particularly for the molecular plant sciences. And so um, this is just giving you an idea. This is one of the main databases for some of the more kind of genome-oriented uh, data sets relating to Arabidopsis. And the kind of work that we're doing is we're investigating which kinds of data are actually submitted to a resource like this and how that happens. Then we're trying to track all the different actors and groups of people who are involved in curating the data or providing some of the key tools and standards through which this data can be um, annotated, curated, and prepared for reuse. And then looking at what happens when people go and browse the database and actually reuse this data for all sorts of different kinds of research. And of course, that also means looking at the visualizations that databases themselves are using to present the data to people who are um, quite interested in investigating them. And as part of that, uh, we're looking at things like material resources for the actual samples from which the data are actually taken, so in this case, stock collections. And we're looking at the ways in which um, the data are labeled, and I've been particularly interested in uh, the development of bioontology, such as the gene ontology, the plant ontology in this case, uh, to actually help with classifying the data and retrieving them. Um, like infrastructures which are created to uh, basically provide cloud storage for this data, but also partly to provide an architecture through which discovery can be achieved and retrieval of the data can be achieved. There's a great group uh, here in Cambridge who's working on Intermine, which is a particular uh, uh, set of standards which is um, aiming at making data collected on different organisms compatible with each other. And so there's a whole set of people working on this, and many, many, many others, in fact, and then like uh, other. Um, um, depositories for this data which will do slightly different things. So just to give you an idea, even just to track this journey, which is actually one of the easiest ones we are dealing with, we're looking at uh, easily a thousand scientists involved in providing standards, in providing different types of infrastructures, etc. etc. Now, um, we have looked at quite a few other journeys, uh, some of them very large, some of them uh, much more reduced. 
But the new one that we've been interested in is um, a project which was looking at the integration of health and environmental data, which was basically between Public Health England and um, the University of Exeter and uh, the Met Office, where we, um, where we started to look at some of the issues around data integration. And the use of, and in fact, the reuse of sensitive biomedical data. And in that um, instance, we worked uh, very closely with the CL Data Bank, the Secure Anonymized Information Linkage Data Bank, which is, I still regard it as basically one of the best cases of how to not just anonymize, but in fact, make usable and assist researchers in using biomedical data, certainly in the UK, but in fact, now increasingly is regarded as one of the great examples in the world for how to do this. And we looked at uh, how does, um, work or data collection which is happens on one species end up being communicated to people working on other species and how does that inform cross-species uh, knowledge production. In here we looked at things from yeast to um, human databases. And of course uh, the ways in which plant data that may originally have been coming from Arabidopsis are then used to inform work say on, um, on the collection of crop data and the analysis of crop data in various parts of the world. I was uh, this summer for instance in Nigeria working on cassava and looking at how some of the labels created for some of the plant ontology and the crop ontology in the western part of the world end up informing very closely the collection of economic data in those environments. So just to give you a flavor of the kind of things that are inspiring this talk. But so, uh, just now to go to a much higher level of abstraction, these are the five challenges of big data reuse that I want to discuss today. And I'm going to start from this one. The idea that, in fact, when we are insisting on the reuse of big and open data, what we're actually doing is we're pushing a certain strand of conservatism into research. And this is a charge that's been leveled several times at the reuse, particularly of open data, and in fact it's been seen as a potential objection to open data, and I think there's very, very good reasons for that. So, um, one of the big problems that we keep seeing is what we would call the problem of old data. So, as you saw in the, in the small example I gave you from Arabidopsis, at least I think you've got the flavor of the fact that what we're looking at increasingly, and that's happening all over the place in every branch of science, we see a highly nested collection of data infrastructures that depend on, from each other on a variety of ways, are all interlinked, are all doing different jobs, but they're sort of part of the same um, interdependent ensemble of data infrastructures that you need to actually do some decent work with the data that are ahead. Now, this creates all sorts of interesting issues in terms of how does one um, think of um, making this um, intersection of databases sustainable. First of all, they're not really easily interoperable. It's very difficult to produce language that you can use to order and retrieve those data. Ontologists are doing a very good job in some fields of actually doing that, but of course there's still a lot of disagreement going on about which ontologies to use for which type of data and whether the ontology you use in that particular field could be compatible and how with ontologies used in other fields. So there's a, there's a big question there. Um, there is a lot of work going on on what does it mean to describe an experimental procedure used to create data. So basically what are the metadata that should accompany the data? And again, here there's uh, a lot of questions around the fact that each community, particularly in biological and biomedical sciences, tend to do things in their own way, sometimes for very good reason, because their methods are very fine-tuned to the specific nature of the materials and the questions that they're tackling, and that creates a situation where you have all sorts of different ways of describing experimental protocols which are not compatible with each other, or at least not obviously compatible with each other, which are used in these different databases in different ways. And also the standards, in fact, of what counts as reliable data and, um, and data which has evidential significance tends to shift, oh sorry, tends to shift a lot um, um, throughout this, um, throughout different components of these nested infrastructures. And in fact, with people, I mean, even some obvious examples like microarrays, which you would think uh, in biology are one of the obvious uh, examples of a very highly standardized uh, data set produced under rather standardized conditions with uh, very standardized uh, technology, but in fact it's very contentious because some communities see it as very temperamental. I mean, actually, microarrays tend to shift depending on temperature, depending on all sorts of different environmental conditions. But other communities, particularly more in clinical science, where these are seen as actually among the best standardized data we, we have, and so we, we should really try and rely on data that have been acquired by other groups. You know, these kinds of discussions. In, a real challenge that accompanies this big, big issue about how to make these databases interoperable is the idea of how does one even update these kinds of structures. And of course that also goes together with the consideration that many of these databases are, are very, very different funding sources 
which come and go, which very typically are not long term. And so it's never quite clear where the resources are in this very complicated ecology of data infrastructure to actually maintain each um, infrastructure and to um, keep updating its content. And of course, the content needs to be updated because the technologies are changing, the standards for what counts as certain knowledge claims are changing, et cetera, et cetera. So that keeps being a big issue there too. And in fact, the typical um, thing that we kept encountering when doing this empirical work on data reuse is that common standards help an enormous lot, but they always need to be um, uh, complemented by trained judgment, by people who actually have worked with the standards, know how to interpret them, know how to apply them to the particular field in which they're working. So actually, how to make databases which don't have old data which are to some extent unreliable or not being updated is not a straightforward achievement at all. So just to give an example of that, um, this is um, one attempt that's been done to try and produce standards for um, retrieving and classifying um, data coming from phenomics, particularly from field phenomics, which is basically the attempt to describe the morphology of, of, of plants in this case in a number of ways. This is supposed to really be something that people that go into the field, literally into the field, and look around themselves and trying to describe plants can use to try and collect data in a way that people looking at other fields in other parts of the world can actually compare the results to. And now, and this is the result of a lot, a lot of consultations by some of the main people in the field, and what they came up is a mere 180 categories for types of data that, you know, for standards for types of data that should be collected in a new way, and under each category of the 180, I mean, it, it didn't fit in this slide, it doesn't fit in any slide, I just did a little <laughs> snapshot there, um, are um, all sorts of different ways in which you could interpret the subsets of these categories for the specific uh, data types that you're thinking about. So there are structures for how to, um, you know, frame and standardize this data collection as a general effort. But in terms of actually getting this done in the field when dealing with complex data like this, which are to some extent also descriptive, is a still a very big question. And here is just an extra from a paper that I published with a few colleagues in Nature Plants last year, where we were trying to at least give a flavor to people in plant science about what are the kinds of tools that they ideally should be aware about, um, which can help them in data management. You know, what are the kinds of things you should be aware of that will help you try and manage your data so that it can be more easily, um, more easy to disseminate and to reuse. And just look, I mean, if you can see, at the headings here, not even going to the thousands of examples here, we just picked a couple. Open lab books, generic open data repositories, specific databases, data portals, bioanthologies, metadata standards, identifiers for research materials, informatic standards, data annotation pipelines, guidelines of good practice. And these were just the ones that popped into my head as like, these are the main topics we really should discuss, which are quite different from each other. Very hard not just for researchers on the ground who are trying to reuse the data, to even understand the difference between these different types of data curation and data infrastructures, but even for people who are working within each of these uh, data management tools to understand what the relationship is and should be between all these different infrastructures. They all have a very important role to play, but we're looking at a very, very complex ecosystem. So you can see that actually trying to uh, keep data up to date, keep the standards up to date in this uh, landscape is very, very important. So what is it, the situation is also is that you don't really have, right now we don't have, at the highest level of governance, we don't have a reliable, sustainable business plan for how to maintain data infrastructures of this sort, and that also creates all sorts of problems. There's not really a long-term funding for these things. It may be renovated. I mean, it's, there's more and more funding being devoted to them, but still we don't really have a vision for what the funding for this data infrastructure could be in the future. And that also, of course, makes it difficult for people to commit to give their data to these infrastructures when that's lacking. Um, data curation and all the very high level expertise that is needed to deal with all the stuff that I showed you very quickly uh, is actually typically still not recognized as being an integral part of research, which again creates all sorts of problems for the people who are involved in doing that work, whose work doesn't really get rewarded or recognized as being fundamental to data reuse and eventually to discovery. And, um, and researchers, in fact, keep receiving very little expert support on data management within their own projects. Of course, there's all sorts of tools and people that they can go to to ask questions. You guys in Cambridge are very lucky in that respect. But very often, researchers on the ground actually don't know who to go to. And it's not clear who can advise, who can provide this mediating role in, in, in doing this. So, and of course, I mean, one of the big intellectual worries, um, uh, well, I mean, of course, everything, so this 
conclusion from this is to think that actually, in fact, in the absence of intelligent human prediction and, um, and intersection between these resources, what happens with the database is that they tend to either disappear or, in fact, worse, they stagnate. But it's not clear that they stagnate. It is not clear that this stuff is actually completely out of date. It still is on the internet. It's still possible to relate to. And this creates this problem of old data. Also, one other thing to just point to very quickly is this idea that, in fact, this general focus of reusing data rather than creating data which is tailored to particular pro projects, in what does it mean in terms of thinking about creativity and innovation in research? I mean, this certainly is a question worth asking particularly given in fields like biology and biomedicine, when the objects you're studying very clearly are developing and evolving. And so the question is, what, I mean, how do we then contextualize the data we've collected 10 years ago to make it possible to use it sensibly in a way that doesn't constrain creativity, imagination, and, and, and research at this point in time? So, second challenge I want to think about, which in a sense follows, I mean, everything here hopefully will follow one, one from the next, <coughs> is this idea of what does it mean to build on unreliable data? What is the risk here? That, that's exactly what we're, what we're starting to do. Well, I mean, you probably already got this point of potentially what we're looking at. This is a house of cards, right? Like lots and lots and lots of data infrastructures where they're all interdependent, they're all very important, but if one of those blocks starts to be missing, and this has happened in some of the research communities we've dealt with, what happens? Suddenly, a lot of the mechanisms actually stop because the data flow is stopped. So data needs to find a different way to travel, and that has all sorts of implications for how then we think about research. This, of course, has implications also when one thinks about data quality, and particularly the questions about how does one locate error in such a system, how does one evaluate the provenance of data, and in particular, of course, this becomes a big problem with data travel outside of the expert communities of practice that actually know, I mean, there is a sort of tacit knowledge around how does one evaluate the, the quality of the data. So, of course, when one thinks about this, the immediate um, response is to say, well, I mean, to be able to recontextualize data so that it gives you meaningful information, what you need is to have very, very good metadata that really describe, even to people who are not experts in the field, how data were acquired, what are the important things to look out for, et cetera, et cetera. But of course, again, this requires a lot of work and very good annotation work, et cetera, et cetera, and this is very often not done. Another thing that we saw uh, very clearly, and I've been asked, I don't know how many times, to try and provide also by the EU, I mean, there's, oh, I'm, I'm now uh, the co-chair of the Fair Data Group for the European Union, and the constant request is, let's produce guidelines for data quality. What could be general guidelines for data quality? And I keep repeating, this is nonsense. You cannot produce data guidelines for data quality because data quality really varies, these assessments, depending on the intended use of the data. I mean, you really cannot have exactly the same ways and balances like for everything that's happening, even within the same field. There's going to be different uses and different levels of reliability of the data depending on what is happening. So that completely seems uh, quite a bit. And of course, one of the things also that happens in terms of assessing data quality is that that assessment very often depends on having access to the original material samples and the instruments with which data were originally collected. I mean, that's partly to do with reproducibility, but partly also just having the skills to be able to assess what this data may actually mean. And this is very difficult because, for instance, collection of samples, certainly in biology, tend to be unsystematic, very underfunded, and absolutely not linked with uh, digital databases, or in very, very rare occasions that happen. And all the instrumentation tends not to be kept. I mean, of course, again, Cambridge is to some extent an exception to this. You know, wonderful history of science museums, some of the material will be kept there. But generally speaking, um, this is just not really done systematically. So um, data sharing and reuse needs data curation, for sure. That's being very widely um, acknowledged. And this data curation should be intelligent, first of all. That's something that the Royal Society has been defending very strongly. By now, it's, I think it's accepted by many people in this field. It should also be informed by familiarity with the research objects and the target system. And that's something, again, we're finding consistently in case of successful data reuse. But of course, then the question becomes, I mean, does that put a limit to the travel of the data? Does it mean that actually people are using the data still have to have a link to the particular objects and the data were produced? Or can we really think about data travels in a much more extensive way? There's got to be, a, that data, data creation is what needs to be trustworthy, needs to be able to weed out error and, and, and unreliable data. And again, that tends to happen in communities which are much more small-knit and kind of um, 
where there is a stronger sense of why they're assessing data, how it was working, and like what criteria they're actually using to do that. And of course, what you want is that some sort of consistency across time and space, and that particularly is the case when we're thinking about longitudinal data collections. So <coughs> what we found consistently, as I said, is that databases are really relatively rarely regarded as trustworthy, except in communities which are relatively smaller, relatively speaking, and have very strong social bounds and user participation within them. So a very good example of that, and the people who are responsible for this are sitting right in this audience, is a database called Tombase, which is used to uh, disseminate data, most economic data, about um, fish and yeast. And this is, I think, one of the best examples, certainly in the databases that I know about within modern organism biology, of actually being able to produce a database which has a very strong user participation, and uh, where there is a very well done annotation process, and the curation is done extremely well, and at the same time, there's such an involvement of the community that you get a lot of user feedback directly on the database. And that basically gives you a product that people seem to trust to a very large extent, in fact, much, much more than pretty much any other example that we've looked at in, in the research that we've done. So in, in introducing some of the people that uh, were dealing with Tom Days, and some of the things that people noted were the fact that um, this indeed comes from a close knit family, and, um, and the, the, the curators are trusted to be doing a reasonable job of the annotation, uh, partly because the users are well known to keep uh, checking these results. So now going to the last three challenges, I'm going to take much less time to do those. Um, first of all, there's a question about trying to make bias invisible. I mean, I think this point is basically summed up by this slide, with the idea that, well, you know, we've done the big data, we've done a great, we've done content analysis, and nobody thought to include the most important thing, like the classification sample. So um, here, basically, this is the problem of partial data, or so-called so convenient sampling. So big data collections tend to be extremely selective certainly the ones that we've looked at. Databases tend to display the outputs of rich English-speaking labs, which work within very visible and popular research traditions, and deal with highly tractable uh, data format. So sequencing data are great, imaging data, uh, like there's a very expensive, we're not quite sure what to do with this, we're, we're gonna leave them for later. The involvement of poor and unfashionable labs, people working in developing countries, and of course non-scientists, is very low, and typically at the receiving end, these people are not involved in producing the databases, they're actually not involved in using them, but unless you're involved in developing them to some extent, you actually very often have no clue what to do with them at the user end side. There are huge disparities in data sources, the types of data that can be curated and reused, there's a big inequality in representation of the populations which are involved in this, etc., etc. And what's worrying here, I think, is the sampling of these kinds of data is not, is not really based on epistemic uh, reasons, but it's based on convenience and institutional and financial factors. So this resulting bias remains unaccounted for, which I think is a relatively novel situation in science. We, we put across lots of different fields and very, very good ways of accounting for the implicit bias in the data collection. But what's happening in some of these big data conglomerates is that this accountability is getting lost to some extent. Now, this may be a prioritizing commercial interest. Well, um, as I said, again, following from the previous point, there's a bit of a triumph of commercial and opportunistic concerns here over what seem to be scientific reason and investigative decisions. So data choice, processing, dissemination mechanisms seem to be governed by non-epistemic factors. And in fact, particularly in the US, of course, there's complete lack of appropriate regulation of what counts as good data dissemination and how they should be commercialized. And there's a complete lack of clarity over legal regimes that apply to the dissemination of big and open data, and that pretty much goes for everywhere. I mean, the GDPR is coming, but I feel, I feel there's gonna be a lot of confusion still. So, um, the last point I want to make is, well, actually, the potential here to encourage research which is relevant or even damaging to society, of course, much has been done on the relationship between big and open data and citizen engagement in data collection, particularly, things like, you know, citizen science, like, I'm not going to go into trans science and all these kinds of things. Um, but in fact, that is like the same stuff, and even in data does not really happen in a vacuum. There's all sorts of um, things that structure the ways in which different types of publics and different citizens around the world are actually um, dealing with data. And the result of that is um, very often things like data linkage, particularly biomedical data linkage facilities across different data sources, tend to involve very serious risks to individuals and actually particularly to communities. 
So, you know, particularly say in rural areas where it's very, very easy to identify a set of um, data applied to a particular small community because there's not that many people in that area, so it's actually quite easy to work back what actually does this data set tell me about um, the health, say, or the environmental conditions of that particular population. And so, these output potentially are damaging. And, of course, this means that data sharing and reviews also need to be ethically sound. Now, in how to do this, I'm not going to summarize if you got the point by now. I think one of the lessons learned from some of the research we've done is that context-specific curation really is key to data reuse. It's absolutely essential. So um, to be able to really make data interpretable and reusable, you do need to have expert curation by people who have spent their career thinking about that problem. And in relations with communities involved, that really is kind of basically acquiring the expertise that you need to do these kinds of things. And of course, uh, it's important to keep value in those kind of research traditions and, and reviewing methods used um, to produce these data infrastructures, but at the same time, to produce data infrastructures which are user-friendly, receptive to user feedback, and kind of um, and encourage the use of uh, case by case judgment to make apologies, uh, these kinds of things. And um, generally speaking, uh, taking into account the fact that science is uh, utterly pluralistic, and particularly when it comes to data collection and interpretation, there's many, many, many different methods and standards used to do that. Taking that into account actually contributes to the robustness of data analysis eventually. And one of the big uh, priorities for all the people we've been working with who are doing a very good job, I think, in, in getting the data used, is to be very careful about the risk of losing system-specific knowledge, which is typically very much <coughs> embedded in the ways in which people um, collect data in the, first, in the first place. So things like data linkage methods become very, very important, particularly when it's actually always possible to disaggregate what is happening in terms of the particular data collection you're looking at, or the retrieval mechanism you're looking at, and where it actually came from, which is not always something that people who are kind of dipping into uh, data infrastructures are looking for, but it's typically very, very useful for people who are trying to interrogate the data and actually question whether they are reliable, where it actually came from, and how they can compare it with the data that they're already produced mm. using in the long run. So something like interoperability here is very much preferable to integration in the sense of actually unifying these structures. And a second lesson learned, I think, is that long-term maintenance here is very much key to trustworthiness. So it's very important to think about how to update these data nested infrastructures and to think about business plans for the sustainability of them. And that actually means uh, thinking about what the relation is between international field-specific databases, international cloud that are supposed to cater to all sorts of different data sets, like the European Open Science Cloud, which is now being started, and institutional repositories, and making sure that the nodes are resilient, and the system is actually not crippled, but uh, by the same time, by the failure of one node. Um, and, and of course, this particularly when thinking about problems in, in terms of data quality and the fact that um, it's very, very hard, very often for people to, to reuse the data unless they've been, to some extent at least, exposed to what it means to develop these data infrastructures in the first place and to classify them and categorize them. So the third uh, lesson learned here, and this is more philosophical territory in, in many ways, is that, in fact, as I said, indiscriminate calls for open data can often lead to serendipity in what data are actually circulated and, and when and why. People just say, well, I'm gonna produce open data, so I'll give whatever I have, which I think can just be kicked out of the door, and whatever I think is actually more precious, I'm gonna keep for myself. And the question here is to try to start to develop explicit rationales around which priorities are given to which data types are actually being disseminated and what, it, what resources are being developed and which ones are not. And of course, there's lots of, it's very difficult because there's very substantive disagreements over data management here. The methods are very different, and there's lots of different people involved in handling the data. And one of the things that we've kind of um, been arguing, certainly I've been arguing as a result of some of this work, is that in fact what we keep seeing is the criteria for what counts as good data, in fact, the criteria for what counts as data altogether vary dramatically even within the same field. People have different interpretations of this. And that's partly also because there's very, very different types of expertise that keep making choices about what constitutes data throughout these data journeys of being very quickly describing. So the philosophical lesson I'm taking out of this actually is that data should really be conceptualized as relational objects. These are not representations of nature that come ready-made and should be respected in some way 
but actually data are objects which keep changing throughout their lives, and it has to be disseminated as a chain format, if you want, but acquire an evidential value when they're actually put in a particular context. And pretty much only in that context they can be evaluated as being animals. We can have a lot of discussion about this, but that's basically the general framework, which basically brings us to consider more general ideas about what does it mean to think about epistemology of big data use here, and what I've been trying to defend is the idea that inference from data is actually really a process of situating and ordering data in relation to a particular context, particular elements of relevance to interpretation. So, in fact, developing a context for inquiry that aligns the purpose of the inquiry with the existing theoretical commitments and selective properties of data and the target system. That is, again, a very nice way to think about this because of how the scope and the objective of a lot of data infrastructures is actually to allow you to organize and reorganize and reorder and revisualize and remodel the data in lots of different ways so you can start to think about comparing alternatives and use that to generate different interpretations and, and different ways of thinking about the value of the data. And, um, well, I mean, I'm not going to go very much into this, but just to say that I think one of the things also that comes out of this is there's a lot of talk about the undulation of different sources being the secret to having good inference, because that's great, I mean, you know, that's the typical big data advocates um, solution to these problems, is say, well, doesn't really matter all this stuff about the accuracy of the data or the quality of the data, just put lots of different types of data together about the same phenomenon, and they will sort of converge towards a truthful picture of what the world looks like if you just trust that. And I think, well, triangulation is very, very important in that sense, but in fact, it's not sufficient at all. Partly because the partiality of data sources, which is very difficult to account for, so how can we really be sure that all these different data sources actually provide a complete enough triangulation that would reflect what's going on in the world? And also because, um, because of all the efforts that are actually required in trying to maintain continuity and commensurability um, across different data sets or even within the same data sets, um, when you're reassessing the data set with different methods across time. And I've written something about this, and the philosopher Alison Wallen that done actually a lot of work around this. So, I mean, I already mentioned the fact that another lesson learned from our work was so important to think about the relationship between digital data and the materials to which the data are actually related. And I think one of the interesting projects uh, that's going on around this, is just a start, but something, which is this collaboration between different natural science museums to try and make sure that the ways in which they make their collections available is kind of, to some extent, standardized, and at least it's possible to retrieve what is actually happening in each of these museums. Of course, museums are just a very small part of these puzzles. There's big issues around biobanks, but at least the fact that this issue is now being start to come to the fore, I think is very important. And just finally, but not least, is the fact that, in fact, I think when it comes to data management and this kind of considerations, ethics and the role of the humanities and social sciences actually becomes a, a really important uh, component of trying to manage data sensibly and sustainably. So what we keep finding is that actually ethical, social, and security concerns are typically seen as the kind of um, you know the, the kind of thing that nobody who does data reuse really wants to think about because it's very complicated, and then that means that there's all sorts of things I cannot do, and it's incredibly annoying, and then I have to jump through all these legal hoops, and the data protection and I can do this. But in fact, what we found is that people who set up their projects, which are partly based on secondary data use, partly considering issues to do with ethics, sustainability, and um, and, and, and security concerns end up having a much better longer term uh, success in reusing the data and actually in elaborating technical systems that allow them to mine them effectively. And so there's a whole conversation about what can be, uh, can be had around what are the, the skills that one needs to do proper data reuse and, and actually to manage the data, and what kind of training one needs to, one needs to actually then develop to reflect this intuition, which would include elements which, are, uh, uh, which basically touch on ethics, touch on social science, Touch on philosophy, etc., etc. So just for a very quick conclusion, um, the, some of the conditions I've been trying to point at in terms of thinking about big data reuse is first of all to try and recognize as much as possible how how data selection, sampling methods, and data quality assessment are all operations which are very localized and very situated. But at the same time, recognizing that doesn't mean that we have to give up completely on the idea of reusing big data sets. Quite the contrary, it's just that you need to take that into account when setting up infrastructure standards and institutions that allow you to do that effectively. 
So this recognition really should inform decisions about how you set up these infrastructures and also, of course, about the scope of the intervention that one actually one takes out of this data, what they actually apply to. And also I've been trying to defend the idea that effective context-specific sustainable data curation is to be promoted as much as possible and integrated as much as possible into what is recognized to be cutting-edge research work. And, and this includes trying to formulate as much as possible explicit criteria for the inclusion and formatting of data and metadata into data collections which are available online. And then this uh, means trying to build as much as possible accountability for the choice and the sources of data which are included into infrastructures and analytic tools, providing tools to track the history of data journeys through metadata mm -hmm. and through tracking the ways they used to be used in the past, and trying to avoid things like irreversible data linkage, which really don't help <laughs> in that sense, and strengthening as much as possible the links between the existing data and the research materials from which they were originally obtained. And finally, building safeguards for social and ethical concerns to improve the research methods. And here we've been uh, defending the idea that, in fact, I mean, this is not just a question of making, making this work legal or even making it more socially acceptable. This is really about the technical sustainability of some of these initiatives. Having um, these kinds of safeguards, having people to help thinking about what does it mean in the longer term to curate big data, what does it mean in terms of thinking about potential implications and potential applications, really can help to actually make the science better. In a sense, even regardless of whether or not we think that you know that means that we socially engage better or, or things like that. So this is what I want to say. I leave it at that. So Sabine has actually left us with a fair bit of time for um, questions. So if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll join us up. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'll be taking a list. These journeys of data and these histories of data. Um, my question is this, probably uh, you've, you've talked about the, the, the metadata and what perhaps it's easier to lose the metadata than the data. My question is, have you uh, done some research about the models that are learned from the data, whether they are reused or completely lost because they are a little bit above the metadata? Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, there's a sense in which this, those also have their own trajectories, right? I mean, I wouldn't be able to generalize because certainly in the cases we've looked at, because partly we've really proposed to take in different parts of research that we wanted to, because we wanted to see and compare what is happening in slightly different fields within the biological and medical sciences, the kind of modeling techniques used were very different. I have to say, and the visualization tools used tend to be tend to be quite different. So it's a bit difficult to generalize in that sense. I mean, I certainly would think that. Um, and one of the things for me is quite interesting is that for um, the kind of thing that some of the groups that we dealt with during these data journeys thought were models of the data that originally obtained, actually end up treated as data themselves for groups that come after. Right? And that's partly what I mean by the fact that the data themselves here could, could change their features. Right? And that I don't think is a particularly bad thing. I mean, typically in these data journeys you see a sort of layering of different interpretations and different selection points and, and different labels attributed to the data that sort of make it, in a sense, richer and richer as it keeps traveling across different contexts. But um, what it does, of course, is to, is to channel the data along a very, very specific path of interpretation. And so that's, again, I mean, a lot of the people, particularly, for instance, one of the best cases probably for that is also the most complex that we've looked at, which is this attempt to um, integrate uh, data coming from climate science and environmental science with data coming from hospitals and clinical studies to try and get a picture of how, say, um, uh, weather events and kind of you know, low pressure or so affects people who have respiratory diseases. And in those kinds of cases, um, what you see is that <laughs> the work that basically for people who attempted this, they tend to spend three out of, out of the four years they may have to do a project of this kind, trying to track back the provenance of the data. Precisely because they start to think, okay, actually, it's great to have this data model, but in fact, I, I need to understand how we got to that point in this particular science to then be able to then import it and compare it back to some of the data that I have on this other side, which kind of are, are completely different constitutions. You know, the idea of mortality, for instance, is dealt with completely different, is measured differently. So how, how do I make it commensurable? So without tracking 
these journeys and these different layers of abstraction and interpretation that are built into a data set, it becomes very difficult for people who are trying to do these high level integrations to try and find what is the optimal point between these data sets where you can actually find a um, sort of commensurability, basically, and you can justify that. Well, thank you for your talk, and I think uh, I'm intrigued that uh, after your talk, the title of your upcoming book is Time Scales of Data Use, and my question is exactly related to the example that you opened, for example, integrating climate change data with hospital data, which are not just different kinds of data, but they also function on different time scales. And I'm curious, it, what kind of challenges would then be of reusing data when a new meta language, in a way, needs to be done to coordinate data and find a common ground in this kind of case? I mean, so I mean, that's actually that's a paper that's about to come out, and um, I mean, I think the main message in that paper basically keeps being to think about data historically. I think really what is, it is what it comes down to, and one, one of the things I'm trying to address in that work is the assumption, which is very easily made that the problem of the temporality of data comes up mostly when you're thinking about longitudinal uh, data collections, right? Collections of data that go on for many, many, many years and you have all sorts of problems about maintaining consistency and very often you cannot shift to new technologies because you want to maintain the consistency in the instrument that you're using to, you know, all that kind of thing. And I was trying to actually compare some of these issues with issues that actually are found in everyday cutting edge um, labs in experimental biology where the assumption actually is that, well, in the case of those data, it doesn't really, temporality is much less relevant because ultimately people are more or less using the same instruments and, and, and you know, like they're, they're doing similar things and it's nothing like the longitudinal issues because each data set is produced for a particular project and what you do is you produce data sets and you immediately interpret it and then you go on to produce claims. But of course, once you start thinking about data in, in this way, you open it up, you, you consider at least disseminating some of them, and you have very, very large data sets that you're trying to disseminate, you immediately run into very similar problems to the classic longitudinal data collection, which is, okay, so now my data actually needs to have a temporality attached to it, because it's gonna be uh, circulating for God knows how long. It's gonna be very important for people to understand when this one should be done, under which conditions, which these instruments, etc., etc. And so suddenly you get a situation where the temporality of the data becomes very, very important as a criterion, and certainly among the metadata units attached to it, like in fields where this is not entirely clear to people, or at least is not really being part of the culture so far, because there's such a big shift between collecting data so that you can produce your paper for this particular project and collecting data also with an eye to the fact that you may want to then publish your data set as part of a kind of open data repository for future reuse. So that was part of the issue. Thank you for the talk. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the point you made about the importance of data curation. I was just wondering if you think, um, when talking on a large scale about reuse of data, whether you think it would be best if that became part of the research and the data generation and the responsibility of those doing that, or whether it would be more effective to have external kind of specialists or experts whose responsibility it was to curate data across the whole field. Yeah, that's, a, that's an internal big question. In fact, because that's the center of all the EU discussions right now, what is actually happening. Of course, universities don't want to have people specialized in this because it's an additional investment. I mean, the constant question is, you know, if we end up investing money in data curation, we are taking a research budget. So is that something we want in research, that we are actually taking money out of research budget that could be used to produce new knowledge to facilitate data curation? And my perspective on this is basically one needs to bite the bullet. Partly because um, really telling scientists that now they have to do open data and sort of deal with it is a completely unrealistic and partly that slide I had with all the list of all the different data management tools that one could go to in plant science. I mean, the, that paper was produced by myself and five people in the field who basically have done almost nothing else the last 15 years, but have been specialists in tracing and kind of consulting with all the big data management tools in plant science. And between us, it took us two years of consultations even just to think that maybe we had captured some of the main things that are going on, and as soon as the paper came out, which was two, year, two, two months after we really finished it, there were immediate complaints about the fact, oh, but wait a second, now this has changed, and like there's something else. Now, it's impossible for somebody who does research in their lab, who has other worries, needs to deliver to a particular project, to keep track of all of that. 
is really completely impossible. I do manage with my own data, and I'm supposed to be one person who's sort of an expert on this kind of stuff. So I think necessarily one needs to think about data curation as a high-level skill that is not just for researchers to think about. Of course, there also needs to be increasing awareness among researchers, and there needs to be some training attached to this, which is now little by little happening. But I think that the answer is probably somewhere in the middle. Some resources will basically need to be allocated to data curation if this is a, a, a direction that we want to make in any way sustainable. And at the same time, work needs to be done in training people in how to collect their data and plan the research in the first place so that actually it's possible to interface with these tools in the easiest possible way. Um, I wonder if uh, you'd like to comment on the possibility of using the large international institutions to standardize how we deal with large data sets. Um, the IEEE in the States, which is electrical and information engineering, um, sets up standards, for example, for image, large image data sets, um, states what sort of objects they are, and almost gives us a language for handling the content of imagery. Um, this has been done under the MPEG umbrella. Um, do you see this happening in lots of other fields? Well, I mean, I think that that's a very difficult question because on one hand, I think these efforts are really important. It is important to think about inter at the international level what the potential languages could be. But I mean, there are several issues. First of all, there is a big separation in the kind of expertise that are called upon when creating these kinds of standards. So most people that I know in applied fields, including a lot of data science, which is intersecting, interfacing directly with um, um, with research scientists in biology and biomedicine has absolutely no awareness of these particular standards. They're thinking about the world that's happening at the RD, the Research Data Alliance, for instance, that they have other reference points. So we're already seeing an enormous proliferation in attempts to produce this fabled, ultimate, large standard that everybody will be looking at in terms of how to do their own data. And, um, so there, is, there are issues around that. There are issues around the fact that in some fields, it's, relatively, it's still very difficult, but relatively easier to do this kind of work, like for instance in high energy physics, because what you have there is a research which actually is only possible through the use of very expensive, very large experimental facilities, of which there are not that many in the world. So you already have a centralization of research, which has a different role to play, say, in biology and biomedicine, but actually the whole point is to look at variation. And when you're looking at variation as a definition of the work you're doing, also that comes in territory, you're going to have very fine-tuned um, epistemic communities and methods and instruments that will allow you to capture the particular variables that you're interested in in relation to the organism, say, that you're looking at. But now you have a situation where people who are doing things differently are doing them very often for very, very good reasons within their own field. Now, that I don't think makes it impossible to adopt these much more overarching standards. But a lot of work needs to be done in mediating what is happening. I mean, why are people doing things as they're doing them in their own little context? And how can that potentially, possibly, maybe not, map with these big initiatives? The thing that worries me quite a bit, particularly when it comes to the biological and biomedical um, realm, is that we have a long history of these uh, activities happening. I mean, we have international geophysical like polar years for a long time. We have a lot of initiatives, even in the last 50 years, that have been trying to do this kind of global efforts at finding standards. When it comes to biology and biomedicine, typically they failed rather miserably. And this is actually one of the reasons for this. And now we're going to yet a new phase of this kind of activities. We have Elixir um, in Europe, which is trying to do exactly this, to try and standardize to some extent, to provide a platform for interfacing all these different um, data infrastructures in biology and biomedicine. We have the um, Open Science Cloud in Europe, which is gonna do that at even broader extent. And already now it's clear that while for the physics community it's easier to interface with some of this, for some parts of the engineering and certainly for biological and biomedical science is a very big mess because finding the right level of intermediation between the local level of application and what's happening in the standards is very complicated. Excuse me. Uh, I find this whole discussion very timely. And uh, so thank you very much. Um, I come from the climate sciences and we have a particular issue, which is to decide when the knowledge derived from data becomes decision ready, reliable for use by others. And the costs of doing it wrong are very high. If you make a mistake, it's very serious. 
uh, politically, and if you fail to generate the knowledge fast enough, then you uh, incur a cost and delay in attacking the problem. And so, uh, and this whole question of the reliability of the knowledge has been handled by a 40-year-old social process in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in which they set out to write the largest review articles ever seen uh, every seven years. Now, it's a very cumbersome problem, uh, issue, and process, and it's not actually very open. So you would very much like to see the processes pioneered by that kind of reasoning actually embedded in the internet and working in real time. Uh, and so when that happens, all of the considerations that you brought up about the development of this knowledge will, of course, be filtered into that, will uh, become a basis for that kind of discussion. So I'm wondering, uh, have you looked at the climate sciences, or can you comment on how far, can you comment on how we would proceed further along that path? It's a great question. I mean, I haven't looked in detail at climate sciences, though I've, I collaborated with a colleague, Wendy Parker, who's, who's done a lot of work on that. And also, I mean, I've, I've intersected with the Met Office quite a bit because I'm busy in Exeter and they're just next door to so their colleagues and we see them very often. And I think one of the interesting things about uh, data in, in climate, but basically uh, analysis of data in climate science, is the notion of reanalysis, which I think is really interesting because this is a, a field which, in a quite exceptional way, is taking on board the idea that looking at a certain data set at different points in time with different instruments means having to completely rethink the data set from the very beginning. And I think that's wonderful about the climate science. So I think there's a lot of promise in the ways in which some of the reanalysis testing are used in, data, in, in climate data science to think about uh, some of these issues, probably more actually than we've had in some parts of biology where there's still idea the, uh, this idea of the raw data which are untouchable and we just trust them which is slightly problematic like in that way. So I think that, that's, that's a good part of the question. I mean, there are some uh, initiatives in open science in climate um, which actually stand directly out of the climate gate situation, like the, the, the situation where some emails relating to uh, data collection in England were leaked, and that, that meant that people started to question, oh, but maybe people had doubts about this data collection, so the whole work of the IPCC is in vain because ultimately this data flowed, etc. So the response to that, there is this initiative now, actually, sorry, right now I forget the name, like of actually trying to make some data collection in climate science open and actually directly open as, as it's being collected. Full of issues. <laughs> but I think, I mean, it, it's, it's potentially very promising, but it is interesting. I mean, I think one of the interesting questions that this brings up is, and that's partly why I'm so interested in it as a philosopher, is that it really directly brings up the role of science and how science is perceived in society. I mean, part of the approach of the IPCC, which for better or worse, maybe has worked, maybe not, is to create this picture of consensus and actionable knowledge, as you were saying. So you have a result, now this is something that will be a consensus that will be used for policy. Now this is great for all sorts of purposes. What is less great about, maybe, is creating an awareness among the publics involved of what the process is that leads to have these kinds of results. And I think this is what maybe the very utopical behind some of these ideas around open science in relation say, to citizen science really is. The idea that, well, once you open up the research system a little bit by making some of the results open, by allowing people to scrutinize this work, yes, I mean, you probably enhance people's awareness of the fact that science is very valuable. It's perfectly possible that some of the claims we're making are wrong, we'll be proven wrong very soon. But at the very same time, you enhance uh, people's understanding that there are very sophisticated and very reliable methods used here to produce the data and to interpret that. Of course, how this whole thing fares in the light of post-truth and kind of alternative facts and all the rest of it is a big battle being fought now. But I think the potential is that. Yeah, I should only like to add to your comment about reanalysis. The second law of reanalysis is when knowledge advances, the data change. Because you've used the knowledge process. Yeah, I think that's pretty great. <laughs> so do you have any final questions? Well, let's thanks, Lena, for an incredibly rich.